Okay, it's my biggest pleasure to have a true legend next to me, Mike Huckabee. Great, great. Guess not, there's not really I can say without, um, yeah, sounding silly. Uh, a true legend from Detroit, um, responsible for one of the some of the most amazing tracks in house and techno, and uh, I'm very, I feel very honored that he, sh he will shed some insight on his production techniques, how he thinks that music has evolved with some pieces of equipment and software over the years. And um, yeah, you've been in Berlin for, for a little while now, right? I'm on tour right now, so uh -huh. been here since mid-October. And what made you choose Berlin as, as the... <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the Detroit Berlin connection as as it's is known. So what what's the biggest difference then? Well, I mean, Berlin is the electronic music capital these days and you know, this is where 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 you know, electronic music is heightened or at its peak mm -hmm. uh than any other p part in the world and it's here where so many different opportunities electronically can can happen and take place. So have you been going out a lot, checking out some clubs, sucking in some Some, but not so much because I'm traveling over the weekends and actually reading an 800 page reactor manual while I'm on tour. Well, I think that deserves an applause already. <laughs> I guess you need a lot of endurance to do that. But, you know, because it's all about discipline and, you okay. know, I, you know, we get off into the whole you feel aspect. And honestly, like, you know, reading a manual on tour is, is, is like kind of insane, but I'm actually getting through it. And some of the stuff that I learned in the manual was like, man, what? And I mean, it's going to be pure hell. <laughs> I mean, like. So you think it's a bit like Gavin said that things are getting a bit more easy over the time because the, those pieces of equipment or software are just too overwhelming. Well, they can be, but at some point in time, it's expected that the user digest a bit of principles about synthesis. Uh, you can't keep making music and not know what an oscillator is or an LFO or an envelope. And you know, I drive this home in my class at Ufill, you know, over and over and over. I show the kids what uh, the principles of subtractive synthesis is and how an envelope can help shape drums and sounds and the release stages. So at some point, you have to be familiar with some of these terms if you've been using software uh, to record music with. And uh, we'll dig a lot into to deeper into this as well as your program that you uh, do with at Youthville. Uh, I, th I hope you will shed some insight on that as well, but not to do a whole history lesson here, but I think for some people it's quite interesting with what kind of equipment you started out and when that was. I think your first record was released in 95 on Harmony Park? Yeah, that was my first release. One thing you got to know about me is that I had to get out of the one EP every 10 year club. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just couldn't go on any longer with you know, being so slow. And but is that because you're such a f perfectionist? Uh, well, yeah, a little bit, but, you know, ask Rick Wade about Mike Huckabee working on his hi-hats for, like, forever. <laughs> and, you know, he, 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 like, you know, asked, you know, he called me up, you got Deep Transportation 2 done? Um, not this summer, Rick. But I'm working on the snare. And see, I had to kill that. <laughs> I had to kill all of that. I had to bring a lot of skill to the table. I had to bring a lot of new new skills and not a n new set of uh, understanding about what I'm doing. And, you know, now... But, but were you still going through the 800 pages manual no, of the piece well, of equipment that you just bought or was what took you so long? Well, that was when you had to rely on poorly written rolling manuals. So there was always a, a bit of a difficulty ga grasping some of these earlier, earlier concepts of, of synthesis, I don't think that it necessarily got so easy to understand what an envelope was until software came out. I thought an envelope, you know, 
as, as part of mailing something or something until like, you know, software really did bring it home to a lot of people. Um, it made a lot of things more formal and possible to happen. So what was the piece of equipment that was the most special one for you back then that you started off with? Well, just rolling, all rolling, all the rolling gear, all the classic rolling drum machines, synthesizers, Juno 106, rolling S770 sampler, uh, just basically all of that stuff. And Mini Moog, and you know, then progress towards the Waldorf Wave. And uh, strange about that because I read the brochure and it said you can get any sound out of this synthesizer. So I looked at my DJ crate and I was like, really? And it was like, no, that's not what they meant. They meant that you can get any sound synthesized through the harmonic spectrum. So it's really important to understand what, what some of these, this terminology and what, what is actually possible behind some of the gear that you're using. Uh, you know, because one of my biggest mistakes was ever telling you that I knew what I want and how I could get it. So that you was had the my idea. biggest mistake, telling you, you that I knew what I wanted and that I knew how to go about getting it. That was my biggest mistake. Okay. And what made you change it? And just going back, and, you know, this is another parallel with the students because often we're uh, grown or in our late 20s or 30s and you, we often find ourselves going back to like understanding what a scale is or learning how to like record properly and, you know, everybody wants to just jump in and start making music from the easeability of the, that the computer and software has allowed the user to have access to, but it often you need to, most people often find themselves traveling backwards to undo and unlearn mm -hmm. the, the mistakes that they've falsely uh, held on to because of that. So did you have any mentors back there? Some people no, in Detroit not, not, that showed not you? Not in the software, I mean, not in software until uh, you know, I, well, I mean, you know, I, I was, I wanted to progress at all costs, so, you know, I would uh, hire guys from Waldorf Electronics to come to Detroit. I would fly guys in from Native Instruments. I would go to Prague to, like, do reactor training with guys. I mean, I, I had to go after a lot of this. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, you know, right now is a, is a time where a lot of this is paying off. But in 95, I mean, there were a lot of people in Detroit who were playing around with equipment as well. I mean, definitely, some people who, who became really famous for what they did back then, people like Derek May, Juan Atkins, and Kevin Saunders, and obviously uh, some of the most famous people that came out of them back there. Was there any kind of connection that they showed you how to work equipment, or was everybody just basically doing their own no, thing? No, no, the Detroit techno thing was all in the air. It was everywhere to be found, and you just, you, you had to figure it out for your, you had to figure it out for yourself. It was not so much of, you know, looking over someone's shoulder. I mean, it was just everywhere you could kind of pick up because often you would mimic a lot of the same uh, studio setups that everybody else had. Everybody had a Juno 106, a MMT8, um, a 909 or 808, and you know hundreds of records were produced like this. So, so it, was it was mostly about drum machines, synthesizers. I heard that Derek May once said that you can't sample anything. Yeah, is that, that just yeah, a, that, yeah. is that a rumor or? No, yeah, that was that was that was that was out that was put out there, not to sample and. But it know, has obviously changed. Yeah, it's definitely changed. Um, but I will say that the more you understand about synthesis, the less you will need to sample. For example, um, just reading the manual, I learned how to turn. Um, a drum loop into uh, like and play chord progressions from a drum loop. And I was like, man, what? So basically, here is this.
And I turn that loop into this. So all the music that you heard, and I even played a solo of it, came from that drum loop. And you're probably like, man, how is... You know, that's, that's, some, that's, that's within Reactor, you know, that's, you know, that's, you got to enter the Shaolin Temple to get those skills, but. So, so on which page of the menu does <laughs> exactly. it show that? <laughs> exactly, exactly, and, and, no, and, and I will show you, I, you know, I, I can show you, you know, how this was done, but, you know, and this is halfway through the Reactor manual, and the one thing I will say about Reactor is, is if you know Reactor, if a man knows Reactor well enough, you can punk this entire the genre of electronic music. Not just a genre within electronic music such as house or techno. No, you can punk the entire genre of electronic music. It is possible. Mark my word that I said that one year from now and see, see the difference that uh, my music will progress from this day forward. All right, so maybe we, you have some sound samples um, that were prior to Reactor though. Yeah, Maybe I mean, I, people, you know, I was I making... I can't even afford your first record anymore. I just checked on Discogs today. It's really well, see, expensive. That's, that's <laughs> the part of the ethics of my production skit that I put in there because usually I feel that if it will move me, then it'll move somebody else. And I, I make sure that my records uh, meet a high standard. Uh, a lot of it comes from working in a record store for 14 years, you know, being uh, the guy that would evaluate so much music and, and know what a good record is from one week to the next and having to make decisions, making purchasing decisions as a buyer in terms of what tracks will work, what tracks will sell, what people are looking for, what people will go for and this type of thing. So it's like a melting pot for me. Who were, who were some of the names that were influencing you back then to or basically inspiring you to make music? Uh, I would have to say Carrie Chandler, Carrie Chandler definitely, and still to this day. And you know, early on in, in your production career, like you would have these guys on a on a pedestal, just an unreachable pedestal. And now it's you know that it come when your skill level increases, that that pedestal comes down to just really ad, admiring those guys and appreciating the work that they do and can continue to do. Okay. So. Excellent. So I guess you have a lot of sound samples on there. Uh, maybe we could just uh, listen to one of the tunes from back then so people get an idea what it was like before Reactor came along. A lot of songs are like purely Reactor, like purely Reactor. And uh, then when Machine came out, a lot is purely Machine and Reactor. I mean, just tons of records. Are cool. And it's always Reactor. When a person is skillful in Reactor, they're not just skillful with the software themselves. That set of functionality or skill set uh, is reciprocal to hardware. So when a person is, really understands Reactor and, and software, you also understand all things uh, on the hardware side of things because it's a reciprocal relationship. But I heard that there was this, um, and I think those first two tunes are from that EP as well, My Life with the Wave, right? I, I read this really interesting story. Uh, when you bought that Waldorf Wave, which is a synthesizer as well, and um, that you took the day off to wait for the UPS guy to deliver it? I mean, that was one, one day, and you know, we just, I sat there one day. I sat there one day and had to synthesize and decided that I would have to make an EP with it because I wasn't really using it much. And I thought that it'd be really foolish to have this expensive synthesizer in my studio that I'm not using. Now I could have sold this, but that wasn't an option. So I had to buck down and, 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 and learn how to use it. Reactor helped me a lot with that, looking at the reciprocal relationship of parameters, uh, terminology, and just 
different uh, approaches to synthesize sounds. So, you know, that's all that's all one synthesizer. And I said, In this tune. no, you mean? I said uh, I did a little demonstration. Uh, I did a little demonstration um, on the sample CD, and I said that, you know. If you need to look beyond one synthesizer, you need to make sure that you've exhausted all of its synthesis methods and capabilities before you pass on to another synthesizer. Because one synthesizer really is equipped with giving you all the sonic ranges and possibilities uh, that, that could make up a track. Because your ear is always looking for different sounds in different frequency ranges, mm -hmm. always. So when, when you, whenever you're stuck making music, just ask yourself, what frequency range is this track missing? So if you have bass frequencies and you have some high hat, and you have some high frequencies, then possibly you're looking in the, in the mid, mid range of solos and lead lines to fulfill the, the space that your ear wants to hear. It because your ear is always looking for a sense of completion in all frequency ranges. I mean, it, this happens with you subconsciously all the time, even when you're listening to music, even when you're dancing to music. So right here, this is just going kind of low, and then, you know, this floaty line comes in, which is in another uh, frequency range. in another frequency range and then throughout a and throughout a song you know you you hear different things in different frequency ranges so that you have a satisfying uh, experience listening to music so then later on so you're doing this subconsciously whether you know it or not so I guess it's something that you tell your students as well because you're running this program in a center called Youthville yeah, in Detroit. Yeah. Maybe you can tell a little bit about that. What well, that well definitely. Like. You know, we have some we have some kids and um, that are trying to get a grasp on music production, and that's why I think the reactor is extremely f fundamental for even a 11 to 12 year old kid because the goal is to equip them with a life time skill set in terms of producing music at an early age and often those kids start off on the wrong path and you know I hear a lot of the tracks that the students come in class with the, they're like in the red like crazy they're distorted they don't know how to record properly and you could just see that if this doesn't get ironed out that they're going to have a lot of problems throughout the rest of their production career so again, you know, it's the whole aspect of discipline that actually makes a difference. But with youth, youthful students, they just come to you and say, this sounds weird. No, it's actually a program where, where kids can come after school. Yes, and it's a, uh, you show them how to make techno. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, facility that's privately ran, which students between the ages of 11 and 19 can take uh, courses on nearly anything, audio, broadcasting, Pro Tools, Reactor Reason, Ableton, uh, building computers, everything for $25 a year. And we have some bright students. We have some, this, this semester was really cool with like the whole like resident advisor. That really helped us out because we, you know, a lot of kids were in need of computers and a lot of people who had saw this uh, video and came forth and started contacting me and said, how can we help out? How can we uh, contribute? How can we uh, uh, support your class? And Native Instruments has always been a supporter of uh, you, you know, me and my relationship with you, Phil, as well as with them myself. And mm -hmm. they supported uh, you, Phil, and me teaching there from day one. So, you know, when you talk about the Detroit-Berlin connection, the Detroit-Berlin connection of the millennium 
will be between companies such as Native Instruments, you feel and myself, and, and, and what's happening there. That will be the Detroit Berlin connection of the millennium. One of your famous students is Kyle Hall, is that of what? Yeah, Kyle Hall was a student in my class, and he's taken off, and he's enjoying a lot of traveling right now. But we have some, uh, you know, this, here's this 11-year-old kid that's just 11 years old, and he was making beats since he, for five years. And he, so do the math, and like this, you know, this kid blew me away. <laughs> And this is like the second day of class. And he had never seen machine before and just was using it fluently. And so when you see this type of talent, you have to. It's JD's reincarnation. When you see this type of talent, you have to nurture this talent and, you know, watch over. <laughs> You know, that kid, you know, and then, you know, here's another kid that was like 13 years old making broken beat. So how do you how do kids come to you? How uh, do you get them away from the video games and say, well, this is a bit more interesting? Well, some of them know that they want to make music early on, and some you know they show up. A lot of a lot of the parents uh, are looking for things uh, constructive for their kids to do after school. A lot of them are already into music. A lot of them want to be rappers or producers, and so. The word gets out, and they know that there's a program at UPhil, and and so they they show up, and you know they don't have to read 50 pages of the manual before no, they are no. allowed to I make No, no, I mean we beats. try to keep this organic, but you know, you know, all the music in that resident advisor film was made in class. And, you know, uh, here's one of the students. Playing all this, you know, 12, 13 year old kid. Of course, I helped him, but. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pushed them forward to do sound programming design for like some reactor instruments, and you know, that's something that an 11 year old kid could have as a, as, as a foundation that could last him a lifetime. You can show us a little bit what you teach the 11 years and maybe we comprehend as well. Well, here is a reactor device that the students did um, preset and sound design for. It's called Rolodex by a company called Twisted Tools, which makes elaborate reactor devices uh, independently of uh, the Native Instruments Library. So here is a basically a beat slicer with six different attributes that you can apply to uh, the sample that you load in. So another thing that I want, so here is one of my students beats and when we're in the class I, I actually force the students to make a beat per minute, one beat per minute, move on, make another beat per minute. And this kid's beat, he made, he literally made this beat in one minute and they got approved for sound design. He didn't even have time to think about it, so. <laughs> he had one minute to think about it. So here in this device, you could apply different things. So here's resonance, if we turn that on, we can step right to resonance. As you can hear. It. 
and you can go forth with That's reverb. Only Maybe you can break it down a little bit because I mean for there were only a few people here using uh, machine and um, that's basically a plug-in for reactor. This is that a plug-in for, for reactor. It's a, not necessarily a plug-in. It's, it's its own standalone device that can be used as a plug-in in another DAW. But it's an actual uh, standalone uh, uh, piece of gear made by a company called Twisted Tools, which I do sound design for myself. And it basically uh, can rearrange and process um, audio. So, you know, you can slice a loop, you can step draw uh, your filter pattern, you can put delay, write that as a pattern, and reverb, flanging, and even the external effects. So, it's a, you know, don't really want to go too deep into that, but here is just. Now, you know, next we'll go into reactors. So, okay. you know, this is the sum of the activity that has been taking place at UPhil, getting some of the students professional sound design work at a really early age. What's the next step for them? Do to you... just sharpen their production skills and, and release music, basically. Uh, we have, you know, a lot of uh, labels interested in being the first to release a lot of the music from uh, the students. Uh, you know, Rush Hour has express some interest in any uh, students that may have some uh, productions ready. I have a couple of students that, you know, could possibly be ready to have an EP on Rush Hour at 11 years old. Because <laughs> I think that's always the, I guess, the most difficult part because there, there's a lot of talent in this room as well um, to have a lot of good tunes, but then you have to find somebody to actually release it. So what's your advice for, for the kids well, that you have there? Well, be patient. I, I, yeah, be patient. Um, it's a way. It's just a process of becoming known through hard work, and they have the kids often have a lot of mentors, like you know, uh, us as older DJs than them, to uh, monitor and see them get steered on the right path. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of what we say is 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 credible in terms of suggesting their music to a label. And Detroit has al always been known as a city where a lot of people want to release the music coming from there. So it's not so hard, I mean, coming from Detroit as, as it could be in another city. So it's a good reference, you mean? Definitely. Okay, well, so I think so too. So let's look at reactors. So here we go. The English alphabet consists of 26 different characters. And from those characters, it is possible to fill up enough books that can supply the rest of the world communication forever. Out of just 26 characters, it is enough to fill the books and all the libraries in the world for a lifetime from just 26 different characters. Well, in Reactor, you have 256 different components that you wire together. So we're talking about oscillators, filters, knobs, uh, envelopes, uh, faders, tape decks, all the things that you would need to wire together an instrument. So when you look, do the math in terms of how exponential that is to 26 different things, the possibilities within music production are endless. So when you do that, you start to understand step by step what takes place on the in panel of an instrument. So, so we start off with a blank instrument. So it's a really nice browsing system. So I could just simply type in like a sawtooth oscillator and boom, it comes up. Here is where you would make your connection to your sound card outputs. 
And here's where you would make a connection to anything that you want as an audio signal coming into Reactor. We won't need that right now, so we need to equip this oscillator with the ability to recognize MIDI notes and also the different pitches of uh, that, that will pertain to the oscillator. So first we need a no pitch module here and we need a gate. So this is really interesting. So when we hook up the gate to the amplitude of the oscillator, so basically it's just recognizing the MIDI response from reactor to a, a external controller. So there, right there, you start to understand what a gate is. So here is the no pitch module and now you can see what this provides. So that's that, but so this sounds crappy, so what? <laughs> so then that's why you start to add a envelope. So here, we start, and this is where you start to really digest what all of these parameters are because you're making them, you're using them. Here comes the sine wave, right? So here, and then we make, create the controls for the envelope. Reactor comes with instruments and ensembles and synthesizers that you don't have to wire together. And in fact, there so many people are so VST hungry. Well, Reactor has over 3,500 different instruments that you could use to record with without doing any of this. But if you want to be a bit more individual, then you have to wire things. That's what I say. So here, so now we get a little more control over that sound. And as we and and you can hear the incorrect usages of envelopes in house and techno tracks all the time. So here, as you can see, that sounds a bit choppy. And if we were making the roads, we wouldn't want to progress from one chord to the next with the attack time in an uh, inappropriate uh, setting, I suppose. So here, if we just turn that up. Turn the attack up. Some of that, and well, the sound is dying off too quickly, so we turn up the release stage. That allows us to move from one chord progression much more smoothly. If, if it was here, it would sound choppy. So you need to release stage up in the envelope. So it's, I guess, similar to every synthesizer. That exactly. Play. This is what's so... Here, you will, when, you, when you do this, you will never forget what a gate is. You will never forget what an envelope is. And you see envelopes on synthesizers all the time. You see them on... You know, you see them routed to oscillators. You can see them as a modulation envelope. You can see them routed to filters. You can see them on, on the output of the sound. You can see them all over the place. When you go back to hardware, you can just interact with the synthesizer uh, extremely easy. So were you going for presets in the beginning and then thought, okay, I've used no, those exactly. 150, 100, and then... And I'm dissatisfied with presets all the time. But what's the difference then to a sample CD? They're, it's a bit like a preset as well, right? Just from well, an artist that you like. Well, they're my expressions of sounds. They're, they're my expressions of what I think would be appropriate for a house and techno DJ to use that I don't hear. But didn't those people who created the presets thought very similar? No, not necessarily. No, they gave you standard sounds that the majority of people could pop possibly be into. If you are looking for an individual sound, and most people are, then you have to rely on making your own sound. Well, to rely on making your own sounds, you have to have a little bit of understanding, and not a little bit, I, I should say a lot. You can't keep going on making music without knowing this, and a lot of people, this, this you know, it's the, just an uh, inappropriate uh, orientation to making music, to keep going on with making music and, and not understanding what, what your tools can deliver. So here we would go out of the sawtooth in there, add our controls for the, the filter. 
So when, when I'm making a so when I'm making a, a deep house sound from a drum loop, there's the science behind that right there. So you just drop it in instead of a sine wave and then no, that comes no, out of it? No, no, no. Not at all. <laughs> Would be a bit too easy, right? Exactly. And that's what kind of separates a producer from the next is your skill. So here the principle of like modulation. So here we go out of this LFO is equipped with the possibility to deliver a sine, tri, angle, or pulse wave. So we'll just take that's the dubstep sound, frequency modulation all in the filter. That is dubstep. <laughs> and so you you know, you know, I'm I've been using Reactor for 10 years and I can just hear all these styles that these producers are are you could just hear it. And you, and you are resourceful to, to being able to uh, not only just emulate or reproduce, but take what they did further. You, it's like a clairvoyant sense of, of listening. When I'm getting uh, remix offers to remix tracks, I'm not even listening to the track at hand. I'm listening to the potential and the possibilities that could be exploited or hidden. The hidden feature, the possibilities that could be Exploited. That's the same thing Gavin was doing earlier. So when you can have, when you can create the same sense of functionality from one program to the next, you become a master at what you're trying to do instead of saying that you can't do it because it's not what you understand or what you are used to. I mean, you can't, you, if you can ride a bike, you can ride a red one or a green one. You can't say that I can only ride a red bike when it's not raining. You, you're, the more, more that you, you know, you're limited when you start thinking about that. So I just duplicated, I just emulated or duplicated what uh, was 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 made available earlier, and and uh, you know I go back to you, Phil, because a lot of students. Uh, I stress this all the time. The students will, will have a lot of questions, and I tell them that if if Kanye West came to Detroit and he was looking for a producer and had a, and he had an idea at midnight and he needed this for his tour and he was in search of a producer, and. And, and if, that's, if a student got that call and couldn't deliver, you, 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 be, you make a fool of yourself saying that or proclaiming yourself as a producer. You want to be able to work in any studio with any, any, any gear that gets thrown at you. You should be able to make it happen. Did you kick all of your analog gear out of your studio? Because Absolutely you not. I, kept more, I relied more on it. You need more hardware when you're using software than ever. Because again, it's a reciprocal relationship between both. It's not, it's not that you make something more exclusively uh, of use than something else. It's the balance between all of it. So when you think there's a lot of emulation imitating But this see, piece that's of the whole point that we have got so accustomed to believing that the, the word emulation is bad or negative. It's not. No, when something can emulate something, that means that it can also function as something. It doesn't mean that it's an imitator. Emulation doesn't mean imitate. It means, it means function as. And see, a lot of people have allowed themselves to, to, uh, to hold on or ad adhere to like certain things that, that are commonly described by other people when it's not necessarily this, this case. So here is a Rhodes, a really good one. A really good Rhodes and Reactor. What's really been blowing my mind away is the snapshot sequencer. And this does not exist in any other program. It is something that you have to have a bit of skill to make and, and, and react. So basically, this can step through the different sequences uh, from the presets. And I'll give you an example of this. And this, 
So here it is. So you see a change, it's changing the presets. This is a snapshot sequence. So when I hold down the corn, it's, the corn is moving through all of those different patches. And you get like a lot of different sonic qualities at different uh, intervals when, you, when you're doing that. So here, like, so if I'm doing this. And I could change that. So here is one going at 10. Uh, now it's going at something else. But how long does it take you? I mean, do you know, oh, I want it to go through this and this and that, or is it just try and error? It's just trial and error, and then you come up with something really cool, and you capture it on the fly, and you just cultivate that, and you make that your own sound. I mean, this is going to be responsible for unprecedented amount, amounts of sound by the time I do some new sound programming for somebody. So is that what, what you tell students when they come to you and say, I want to sound like Mike Huckabee? Yeah, but it's going to take them a lot of work to get to that. <laughs> you, you, it's going to take anybody. It's going to, see, not see, it's going to take a, I mean, like, wait till I spend some time with this. You're going to hear, like, sounds that, like, you're going to hear sounds. And here's a sample that I made from just doing that. That just was from random presets. So another reactor device that, a Twisted Tools device uh, is this device called Vortex, and I use this on my Vatislaw Delay Remix. It just came out. So here we have six different samplers right here that can all be uh, tuned or started at different starting positions within each sample. So when you put six different samples in there, it just becomes like a cinematic orchestra of, of different harmonics and events uh, jumping off from different regions of different samples. So here, that's, that's loop one. Loop two. how this came together. That's pure reactor track. talking about different synthesis techniques that have not even been discovered yet. And if you want to keep pushing the envelope and be ahead of the curve, you have to sharpen your skills. I can't, exp I can't explain, I can't express it anymore that, uh, you know, for me, Reactor is just bringing a lot of possibilities to me. But it's, um, I mean, we heard earlier on that sometimes it's better to focus on a fewer things and learn how to do them well. Yes, you build so. yourself up. You build yourself. You don't start right away, but you build yourself up slowly. Because if you don't, if, if you're, you need to question your, 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 your tools. Are your, are your tools resourceful or are, are they just simple? Are they just, are they nothing that, are, are your tools not anything that can be, cha be challenged? Because you need a, a challenging workflow. Most people have it backwards. They think that you need, you need the simplest workflow. Well, you do need a bit of uh, ease using what you, what you do use, but you also need a challenging workflow that could surprise you and yield a lot more results. Mm -hmm. But what do you recommend to people who say, I only have three hours a week to do music you don't really have the time to invest in doing music and getting into all that equipment, but you have a lot of ideas in your head. Which would be the, the most important 
instruments or features that you say those are, you need to know? Well, these. okay, yeah, that, and that's a good question because you do have a lot of people coming from uh, the music making aspect like that. I have limited resources, I have limited funds uh, to make music. I would, I would identify a lot of things about the music you're trying to make, first of all. Uh, define, define the style of music you like. Define the style of music you want to make. Uh, even going deeper into like why, why would you want to make this music? What do you think that you could contribute to this genre of music? Uh, I mean, just, you know, have a good starting point. Uh, envelopes, envelopes, definitely start with envelopes and tuning. Uh, you know, because you can take a waveform really far. You could take a simple waveform because most of this music is made by four to five different primary waveforms to begin with, and they're just resynthesized over and over and, and just sent over to the next stage and to the next stage until something is uh, crafted or perfected. That's a bit about Reactor on its own. Now let's take a look at Reactor and Machine. You want to quickly say what Machine is about? Okay, so Machine, never seen it Machine is a groove-based oriented and production studio. So Machine 1.7, it has uh, integration with Native Instruments complete A package. So that means that all of your presets can show up or snapshots can show up in Machine. Uh, the uh, parameters on most of the instruments within complete A are automatable now. So you could search through the entire Complete 8 uh, collection for a bass sound. And all the basses from Absinthe, Reactor, or whatever would show up. Uh, strings, or you, could, you could see them all. Or if you just wanted to filter and see those from Absinthe, you have that flexibility. So you mean just you have an entire huge library yes, of you, sounds that you can dig through and you don't have to sample off of records or basically take them off synthesizers. You don't need all the equipment if you have it all in this machine. Well, I mean, sampling is its own thing. I mean, I don't know that you do or don't need to sample. Uh, it works for a lot of people. Uh, it works. But again, you have access to a variety of sounds and they're organized in a way that you could find them easily and tweak them from the control and parameters on machines. So basically, you have eight banks, which can host 16 different sounds. So if you load in your favorite sounds in all the banks, do the math, you'll make a, you'll make a track. It's just that simple. So in my A group, I have all types of different drum kicks. As you can see, the sound quality is really good. Because I don't know which kick I'll use. So I have 16 different kicks. I move on to my B group, and then I hi hats. And they are all in the library? or do Yes, you this is all in the libraries. But I do have uh, a sample CD that has incorporated uh, ev nearly every drum machine that I incorporated into machine. But the library in, mach in machine comes with 14,000 sounds. Only 14,000? Yeah, only. <laughs> How can they only? Yeah, it's just a measly 14,000. Lazy bastards. So now, now when you think about 14 different sounds, that might sound like a nightmare in trying to figure out how to find them. Well, here, according to the uh, this, uh, browsing system here, you can select say kick and all the kicks come up so when i type so when i go to drums and look at kicks they just come up and you select them so i didn't have kick select a kick so now we're looking at all the kicks and there's a real nice nope repeat function so let's just look at so I start off with a track like that and I just play something behind that 
And I can switch between scenes really easy. So what I'll do is just make each scene a individual song or a pattern from, you have 64 different scenes, so I make each scene a significant drum track that I could gener generate a melody from really easily. And I just keep doing that. And then I, I play something and then I switch the different drum tracks to that different melody and I, ah, I like this, I like the hi-hats from this pattern. I like the snares from this pattern, and then I wind up focusing in on a drum machine that comes together from a wealth of drum tracks. Mm -hmm. And I just keep doing sessions like this, so I'll just keep archiving beats. Can you quickly show how you sequence the Okay, the so right, so right now I'm in scene mode. I have scene mode lock. Scene means? Scenes are what you see here, as you can see them jumping between scenes. So the, each one of these scenes contains a different drum, entire drum track that I programmed in. And if I were doing live, I could just fire off my scenes. So yeah. So I can, there's two different scenes right there that could become one drum track. I mean, if you just put anything down, you, you know, you just get, get, you'll get something. So now I go to this scene. I see which drum track fits the most effectively behind any melody that I'm playing out of 64 different drum tracks. And you know, you just have endless ideas and possibilities behind that. And But don't you sometimes also get overwhelmed by the possibilities that you think, oh, maybe I'm well, gonna find a kick drum that sounds even Better than the one At some time, have. you have to stop. You know, just like a table, a table has to stop because anything beyond this is not, you, it has, everything has to have a, a stopping and starting point. Like, so, you know, you just well, look for things that satisfy the ear. You're looking for things that satisfy you. You know, you don't keep, you know, trying to find a new girlfriend. You, you stop. You gotta stop at some point. <laughs> Do you always do uh, a beat no, a minute no, and then... No, uh, uh, no I, I can do that. So here... No. So if I... I get out of scene mode. And then I go to my D-Bank. I can just do that. And I hit record. We got that going. So what I like to do is select all of my vents right here. So what I like to do is select all the vents and shift them. Shift this one time, you'll come up with a pattern that you would have never thought of. So uh, you start off with doing kick drums, then doing snares, and adding something to it, or? Well, I start off with a kick drum and a melody behind something. So that's just a way to generate a, 
a lot of songs really quickly. So if you're working on a remix, you bring in the part that you would like to incorporate in the remix and you just keep going forth over different drum tracks. So in addition to those 14,000 tunes, you brought a bit more on this sample yeah, CD so this that you is, just released. Right. That's the sample CD I did for the Red Bull Music Academy. And uh, they supported that. They made that exclusively available in Australia during the Red Bull Music Academy. Uh, so it's only, it was only available then? Yeah, it was only available then. And whatever I could take home in my suitcase is what I, was, <laughs> I have left. And, you know, this and is how, see how far, you know, you keep going with your production skills, you get these opportunities. Resourcefulness, resourcefulness, because, you know, that's something else I wanted to say. Like, when you, when you think of guys like uh, P. Rock or Kerry Chandler, like, these guys are resourceful to have uncles that had 45 collections and sang disco classics and a father that was a DJ or a cousin or an uncle or an aunt that worked at a radio store. A lot of it is, is also being fortunate, too. But I'm starting to see that, you know, for, for those of us that didn't have uncles that were, like, like collectors and that had insane 45 collections, then that means we, are, we have a lot of work to do. It's just based on hard work. And hard work brings about a new set, sense and set of fortunate and resources. So when I'm doing sampling, I'm, I'm, I'm like not even, I'm looking at the hidden dimensions of samples now. I'm not even, I'm not even using the sample outright if I sample anymore. So here is, is the original sample. So that is put into this clever device called a wave scanner. You know, this is a little bit advanced, and so now here on machine, I have I can map out any of my pre any of my instruments and save that to control the instrument. So every time I pull this up in machine, the knobs are already mapped out. So here, uh, here's the sample, and basically here I'm just scrolling through the different positions because it's kind of uh, reading this sample and outputting. Uh, the out, out the audio in milliseconds, and so here. Original sample that you just that, played before? Well, that's that sample being read by this this wave scanner now. And it's good that because you can't get sued because you <laughs> that sample because exactly. nobody can actually exactly. recognize it. Exactly. Anymore. And this is so whatever sample you put in here uh, can yield different results. And so you know, you, it's just different sampling methods and different uh, approaches to creating different sounds. So here, so I make that a preset and I say a pin and I say that. And now I put some effects from machine on top of that and there you go. get the idea that and just keep scrolling through the different and that's just that region of that sample what did you use to create the deep house chord from the beginning out of the um, drum loop I think you're talking about this right <laughs> that came out of this loop
You know, if your if your music is if your music is important to you and it makes a, a big statement about you, then you need to embrace the tools, learn the stuff once and for all, and just learn it once and for all, and just just travel through the freedom of the highways of, of music making. Don't be stuck all the time and having to pull over all the time. Like just just learn the stuff and go. So I guess we need to sum this up. And um, I think you, you said that you are leaving us one of the, your sample CDs for... Next, the next CDR event. Uh, I'm told that somebody's going to be a lucky winner of a machine unit at the next CDR workshop. So you so will be we able... Have that. We didn't want to spoil you too much because you're already getting synths this time. So we thought we have to keep the machine for next time, which will be on December 15th. And among everyone who submits a tune next time, we'll draw a winner who gets a Native Instruments machine. Isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> and not only the machine, but also the sample CD. And uh, yeah, now you, you saw just a little fraction of what you can do with it. Exactly, and you know the sky's the limit, and you know this is you know where I plan on reshaping Detroit electronic music. Thanks a lot, Mike Huckabee.